Good morning. Uh, welcome uh, this morning. It's great to be together. And um, so we wrap up the series uh, called Created uh, to Become. We've been addressing and kind of walking through the process, sharing the process of picking our words uh, together. And as we get started, um, I want to just take a moment and pause. There are things that happen you know, around us that, um, you know, things that capture the news cycle, obviously, that uh, get our attention. And, you know, part of me, you know, with what's happened this past week and, or really the past month uh, in Memphis with um, Tyree Nichols. And, you know, part of just my sensitivity, because we've been working as a church for um, over a decade, trying to understand better the church's role and what the church holds in the area of racial reconciliation. I think it's an important um, aspect of what we learn. And when you see something like this, you know, I have um, lots of African-American friends, and this is, just, this is just more confirmation of a narrative that has just been going on for so long. Um, I have friends in law enforcement and who work really hard to undermine that narrative, and it's just one more thing that just makes this uh, impossible and just, it just, it's infuriating. And so, um, you know, what I do and what I would ask you to do is this is, you know, um, I think we're going to pause. We're going we're gonna to pray. Um, what I do is, and this started, I don't know, years ago. Um, I've been long saying, you know, tell me a name, tell me a story. Um, a lot of what you'll see um, around these kinds of events is, you know, say their name and I write their name down. I wrote down Tyree Nichols in my journal and I just try to enter in. I just try to feel what it must be like to try to grieve, to try to understand. I don't even try to understand, just try to, to enter in and just let the, the weight sort of sit on me. And what this actually has to do with where we're going today is really important because what it undermines is that what I've become convinced of is, and, and this is just a con growing conviction in my own life, is that the church, the people willing to bear the image of Jesus in the world and walk in his way and do that together is the hope of the world. We have the opportunity to bring hope and to rub against people in ways that offer and extend healing um, and so from that, this is exactly what we're talking about in this series, that who you become actually matters to the world that we live in uh, at some point in the future. So there's a weightiness to this. It's one thing to, I mean, I think the church has an opportunity. We have an opportunity. And so um, I want us to, to open and to pray in that way and to be able to weep with those who weep and um, then to just say, Lord, what would you want to say um, to us about who we are to become and what we offer to this world. A lot of us have kind of, for a long time, have just thought that somehow if we do the right things, the world will become less broken. And it just doesn't seem to be the way of the world. Instead, what I think God wants to do is to bring tremendous depth, a, a tremendous depth of hope to a broken world and say, hey, there is another way um, for us to experience the life that we all long for. So Father, would you meet us in this moment? I, I, I recognize, seen it on my social feeds, I've talked to my African-American friends and this, the grief and the despair, the futility, the anger just gets resurfaced all over again. And my friends in law enforcement who've worked so hard to, you know, to, to not let this happen, just feel just like the rugs pulled out yet again. And so here we are, Father. What I ask is that you would just remind us um, that in this world there will be trouble, but we take heart because you've overcome. The way that you extend to us, the life that you offer to us brings another way for us to live. And would you make us into that kind of people, breaking down every dividing wall of hostility and building a new humanity in, in this place, in this way, for this time. So Father, I ask that, that just the weight of who we become um, would kind of rest on us and give us a level of uh, just kind of seriousness to what you're asking of us and what's gonna happen in these moments today. So I ask you to do that. We trust you and we confess our, our need for you. And I ask all this in your son, Jesus, who is our king. Amen. Um, 
Thank you. Y'all remember this is the end of, y'all remember sketch month, right? Yes? Four of y'all do? So we began um, <clears throat> January talking about sketch month. If you remember, I, I ended up and I, we started this series and I drew a calendar that doesn't look like a calendar. Clay came into the office he presented this calendar to me and he had all the months laid out, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, uh, September, or August, September, June, July, yes, July, August, September, October, it's my birthday, November, December. So you get the idea, February, March, April, May, June, July. And what's, what's interesting is as soon as you look at a calendar like this, you're immediately disoriented because that's not how anybody draws a calendar. So it all of a sudden immediately makes you think of the year differently. It makes you see, think of the world, of the, the calendar differently because you see the calendar differently. And so what I invited you to do is to sort of think about the fact that in 2023, you were gonna arrive at January once again. In December, there's gonna be the opportunity for you to do a personal retreat again. And you're going to have to decide, yeah, it's important, it's not important. And then you're going to arrive at January and you're going to be somebody. Something is going to have happened. And the question is, who is going to show up? Who's going to be there a year from now? And we all start thinking about this idea with my one word and vision for our lives. And what I invited you to do is to take this first season right here and to just sketch some things out, to get some ideas, to give yourself permission to write things down and explore things and dream about things and ask about things in the process or the pursuit of picking just one word. And now, just like with any sketch, at some point in time when you sketch something out, you've gotta take a pen and you've gotta draw a hard line. You've gotta make a decision, you've gotta make a choice about which direction you're gonna go, about what you're going to do. And so when it comes down to your words, maybe you have two or three words that you like and your tendency is gonna be, I wanna keep them all. Or you're gonna try to come up with some clever way to make like some hyphenated acronym or whatever to make sure you have all seven words that you actually like. And what I wanna tell you is this, this is the art, is learning how to pick just one. Howard Hendricks, seminary professor, pastor, he said this famously, he said, the secret of concentration is elimination. That a lot of us think that you can focus on three things at one time, which is the definition of unfocused. And you wonder what's wrong with you and what's wrong with your ability to pay attention because you are trying to do something that actually cannot be done. And so to focus is, means you have to eliminate things. And this is one of the great exercises of picking one word. It's just the discipline of choice. The discipline of picking one thing over another, of saying one thing is going to have priority over another thing, of being able to say yes to one thing and other things. Carson talked about this last week about distraction. John Joy Carson last week, was he not really, really good? I was like, whoa. I was, um, I was watching him in the hotel room and I was like, man, this is really good. And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for his message. He talked about being able to prioritize and to be able to pay attention to what is most important. And, and when you learn to do this, you learn that you're gonna say yes to some things and you're gonna say no to some things. And it is very, very important. It's a very important skill to learn how to say no to things. Because much of our lives, we're just trying to, we, we are so afraid that we're gonna miss out on something that we just let everything into our plates, into our way, and we end up just scattered and pulled. And let me tell you, there is almost no scenario in this world that you are going to be less pulled and less demanded of as time continues to move. It's just gonna get worse and worse. And if you don't learn, if I don't learn how to say yes to certain things and no to certain things, um, we're, just gonna, we're just gonna implode. So, so there's a lot riding on picking one word, right? I'm just kidding. But it is a great discipline. It is a great discipline to go, I like this and I like this, but I'm just gonna pick this one. I'm just gonna pick, that's what I'm gonna ask you to do. So a couple of things that we've been um, doing and a couple of things I think are worth mentioning is we've talked about this series because this isn't just about trying to be a better person. It's about understanding how you're created to become, that there's an intention to what happens in you over the course of time. And so we've been saying it like this, that whatever we live life with 
is most likely or going to be the most shaping influence in our lives. Whatever it is that you live life with, whatever it is that you spend your life with is going to be what determines the kind of person that you become over the course of this year, right? We said this, you know, if you, it's not just the people around you, but if you live your life with, right, this just, you know, you live your life with the, the current news cycle, you're, you're gonna be a really different person come mid-year, right? If you live your life with fear, if you live your life with anxiety, if you live your life with this sense of drive to prove yourself or with your sense of drive to compete or beat everybody else or whatever it is you live life with is going to be the most shaping influence in your life. Which is why we've been noticing that what God has done for us is to invite us into life with God. And we said it like this, that life with God, life with God is the context from which or through which you will become the person that you have been created to become. That what God has done for us in sending his son is to reconcile us to the relationship for which we have been created and so that we can learn how to once again live our lives with the one whom we were intended to live life with and out of that relationship that he becomes the most shaping influence in your life. What would it be like? What would your life be like if he were the most shaping influence in your life over the next 11 months? How might you be different? That's, that's what's at stake. That's what we're looking at. So <clears throat> what I would kind of ask and the way I process this is I think about life with God is I ask myself, where do I take my cues from? What would it be like if I took my cues from Jesus and his lordship and his way? That's a pretty good question to ask because I don't know if you ever thought, I have very strong opinions about certain things and they're right. <laughs> Y'all have any of those? And sometimes those right opinions run against what I read that Jesus says or intends or would do. And you know what I immediately start doing when I do that? I go find a Bible verse that buttresses my view and then I argue with Jesus about it. That's what's fun. But here's what you can always tell. And I'm, I'm, you know, here's what you can always tell because a lot of us have this. We have a way in which we think that we're supposed to live. And we know, we sense it runs against what God has made us to be, against what there's something there. And you can always tell this because in your heart of hearts, what you often do is you try to justify your position before him. Oh God, you gotta understand this is why. And when that doesn't work, you double down and you defend it. And when I find myself in my own relationship with God, the more I'm trying to justify or defend, the more I recognize this is a place where I need to be really formed. I think if you can pay attention to those things, you're gonna start to see some things in your life, some places that God wants to shape and form because he's created you to become. Because there's, there's something about you that he's made and created. He has promised to complete the work in you that he um, has begun. One of the gifts of, of Port City Church to me, when we were starting Port City Church, um, we never said, we got this vision and here's what God's gonna do. Because to be honest, we had no idea what God was gonna do. We just had sort of a hope and a dream and a perhaps this might work if we can just sort of be faithful. What we said is we just wanna help people walk with God. We don't wanna try to convince people that we're right. We don't wanna try to convince you to believe some things. We believe that we can just invite people into a process of exposing themselves to who God is and, expose, and to encounter Him if we can incline people's eyes to him, help them seek and ask and knock, that he would draw people to himself. He's designed people for himself. And so we just wanna work in that direction. And what we learn, and this is the way, the way we think about it now, it's just kind of looking back, I discovered this, that it was just this gift of process. That everything that we were doing, we were just inviting people, hey, would you walk alongside, would you walk? Let's, let's, it's a process. But a process requires something. To walk with God requires something from all of us. It requires you first to actually take a step. To be, you can observe a process, but to participate in it, you actually have to do something. And the second thing, and this is where a lot of us just sort of lose heart, is that it requires a willingness to stay in. 
Most of us are intolerant to not being able to do things well or not be able to do things good. So we talk about spiritual disciplines or spiritual exercises or spiritual practices. We go, I'm not really good at that. And so we just don't do them because we don't like to do things that we're not good at. There were a couple of things that I've looked at over my lives and I can articulate over my, my lives. I've had multiple lives over my life that, that have helped me kind of see. And a lot of this is in retrospect. I didn't have language for it at the time. But in retrospect, that God was doing or breaking in me. And one of them is I grew up with two brothers, an older and a younger brother. So everything was a race a wrestling match or a fight or some version of that. So it was just always competitive. I was the middle. So I always got it from both sides. And so, um, and then just on top of that, a lot of other sort of personality problems. Um, I just was very competitive. And so I played um, volleyball. And I remember, I remember this very consciously. I love to play volleyball. I, I'm, I'm not a very big guy, right? In case you hadn't noticed. Actually in college, I was about six, five, two. I'm just kidding, I wasn't. Um, I wanted to be, but, um, but I played volleyball and here's how to think. I had to look at the people across the net and go, I want to cause bodily harm to them and get myself, do you ever, have you ever felt like that? Like to play a sport? Some of you are like, you're like, that's what you do with your kids. You're like, you gotta, you gotta be ready. That's what's wrong with a lot of us. So, um, so I, I carried this in to ministry. I'm 22 years old. I've got this youth group. I'm like, we gotta be bigger. We gotta be bigger than them. We gotta beat them. We gotta crush them. And the problem is this was like affirmed. Like grow bigger, get bigger, crush those other youth groups. And somewhere in there, I was just like, I don't think this is good. And so, you know, I, I did a lot of work, but one of the things that I did is I couldn't play volleyball because I couldn't be a minister and play volleyball at the same time. So I had to, you know, if your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. So I had to do that. And um, it led me to a lot of processing. And what, what I did was um, I, I decided I was going to run a triathlon. And it, let me, don't think, oh, that's, that's not, I, there was a specific reason I did it. Because I did something that I knew I wouldn't be good at. I needed to learn what it was like to learn something new that I could not win or would not win. And some of you are gonna come up to me and try to coach me. You could have won if you'd had the right attitude. It was my attitude that I was trying to break to allow something else to emerge, right? That's, that's the problem. But it taught me a lot. And, and I had to do some things that I wasn't good at to feel what it's like to fumble, to feel what it's like not to know, not to be instinctive, not to react, to have to reacclimate to this way of doing things differently. And it's weird and it's hard and it takes time. It takes commitment. And my point is in this, when we start talking about these things about walking with God, most people select themselves. When you start asking about their spiritual lives, their spiritual practices, we almost always assess ourselves negatively. How's your prayer life? Why well, don't pray enough? How's your Bible reading? Why well, don't do it enough? How's your church attendance? Why well, don't do it as much as I should? I met a guy the other day and he said, he was pretty, it was really funny. He said, I go to your, because I know who you are, I go to your church. And then he said some really bad things. He says, but not enough though. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah. And so we have this idea that, um, that, that we don't, we just scale ourselves. And so what we recognize is because we're not good at things, we just decide not to do them. And we have to be willing to take some steps and to walk and to do this over time. And here's the bad news. There is no shortcut to discipline. There just is no shortcut. There is no, here's the easy way to be disciplined in your walk. The easy things are going to be the things that train wreck your life. You know that, right? It's gonna be our willingness to walk and to stay and to see what God has for us to trust his strength and his work in us over time that's gonna allow us to become. Um, Donna Piner wrote the devotional last Thursday revealing her word. Uh, and in it, she quoted from N.T. Wright. I wanna put this on the screen and read this together. 
virtue. And he's talking about this idea of, of being a, a sense of inherent goodness. He says virtue in this strict sense is what happens when someone has made a thousand small choices requiring effort and concentration. To do something that is good and right, but that doesn't come naturally. And then on the 1,001st time, when it really matters, they found that they do what's required automatically. Isn't that good? You've gotta, you've gotta do some things a thousand times with effort and with concentration. You gotta pay attention to all the small ways that you act in conversations with people, the way you talk at work. And you gotta make sure a thousand times with intention and concentration effort to, to, to restrain or to be the kind of person you want to become in those moments until one day you go, oh my gosh, I did it and I didn't even think about it. It's like who I'm becoming. Part of the beauty of my one word is a lot of us approach change by trying not to do the things that we wish we didn't do. And what my one word does is to set your sights on becoming the kind of person for whom those things are unthinkable. I didn't wanna to try to be someone who competed with grace. I wanted to try to be someone who could avail himself to other people without having to win all the time. Because it bleeds into everything. It bleeds into the way we do ministry. It bleeds into the way we raise our kids. I remember feeling this pressure. My kids were small. I mean, Jill and I, we just made a rule in our home. We said, you, you know, our, our principle was you cannot lose a game that you are not playing. And we have to have this kind of mindset when it comes to how we approach these things. It, it takes small steps over time for us to become. So let's talk about what this looks like. I wanna look in Joshua chapter three. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It's back toward the beginning of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Joshua, right there in the beginning. <clears throat> and this is interesting because Joshua is sort of Moses' protege. Joshua's gonna take over for Moses and lead the Israelites and um, Joshua and Moses have similar things. Moses is leading the people out of bondage. And part of that is it involves them moving or, or leading them across the Red Sea. Remember the Red Sea parts and splits up and they moves them across. Well, Joshua is leading them out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And he leads them across the Jordan River. He leads them through the Jordan River. It's like a mini version of this first miracle you might think of it. And so here's how it goes. I just wanna just kind of get some some perspective as we watch this unfold. Uh, starting in verse two of chapter three, after three days, the officers, so they're all there. They're about to take off into the promised land. That's what they all know. We're here, we're about to take off. Three days go by and the officers go throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and this was the, the Ark was this symbolic, um, you know, box that was designed um, with the temple and, and all that. And, and it was designed as a symbol of God's presence. So when you see God's presence, that was what they're saying, God's presence, um, that's what they're talking about. When you see the ark go, the Levitical priests carrying it, you were to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go. You're gonna know which way to go by following this ark, by following God's presence. Because you've never been this way before. You have to pay attention because you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Verse five, Joshua told the people, right? We're about to go in the promised land. One, two, three, let's go. Because that's what we do. You know what he said? We're about to head in the promised land. One, two, three, be still. This is not how we do things. I want you to consecrate yourselves. Why? Because tomorrow the Lord is gonna do amazing things among you. I want you to, if he would have known about Sketch Month, he would have probably used it. I want you to spend some time. I want you to consecrate yourself because there are gonna be things that unfold that you don't yet know or understand. You're gonna have to really pay attention. It's gonna require effort and concentration to pay attention and to follow and to see this unfold. In verse six, Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So the priests pick up the Ark and the Ark goes ahead of the people. Verse seven, 
And the Lord says to Joshua, today I'll begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel so they'll know that I am with you. This is really important. They'll know that, that I am with you, that, you will, that your life will be lived with me. As I was with Moses, tell the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant, I love this, when you reach the edge of the waters, wait there until the waters part. Is that what it says? No. When you reach the edge, take a dip. When you reach the edge of the water, go in. And guess what happens after they get in? Then the waters heap up and the whole thing begins to unfold. This is, this is really important. Because here's what a lot of us do, right? We, we come to this place with God. And, and we, we know that God is wanting something or asking us of something. And we get there and we say, God, why don't you do this thing? Why don't you do, do this thing and then I'll go. And so you spend a lot of your life going, why in the world has God not done the things that he's promised to do? And sometimes it's because you haven't done the thing that he's asked you to do. You're waiting, hedging your bets so that if something is, the, the waters didn't part until the priests were in the water. They were in the water. It required them like, right, to take a step to get, whoa, this is, feels really bad out here. I'm not doing that very long. But you get this, he, he, you have to step into a place where only God can pull some things off. And so you can imagine, they step in, the waters begin to heap up, all the people go across. And then all the people go across, and you can imagine, man, because you can, we just sort of read this, but you can imagine the water piled up, them heading across thinking, how long is this gonna hold out? We gotta hurry. They're not just like chilling out, taking Insta, you know, hey, look at this, man. They're, they're, they're probably getting on with it. And they all get across, they're like, yes, we made it, high-fiving each other. And look at what God says to do next. Skip down to verse four, or chapter four. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones, where? Back in the middle of where they just came from. I want you to stack them up so that you'll remember what God had done. Now, most of us think, Oh man, if I saw the parting of the Jordan River, I would, I would never forget that. If God did this, I would never forget that. And I'll tell you, I'll bet you, I'll bet you all of us have things in our lives that God has done, probably in miraculous ways. And we promise to remember in the moment, but now we're like, oh, I can't remember exactly how that went down. When people come up to me and they'll say, Mike, today I really surrendered myself to the Lord or this particular thing happened, you know what I always tell them to do? I might like, get a stone from the middle of the river. Go home, write this down, put the date on it. Why? Because six months, 12 months from now, you're gonna think that you were just having a bad day or you had pizza last night or it was the music. And right now you feel like God has been so close to you. And you're gonna forget what that felt like. And more than likely, because of all the chatter that tends to be around us, you're gonna actually second guess whether it was God or not. And you want a stone. I've got a rock in my office from a spot in the woods about 30 yards from where I'm standing. I came out here because we were about to get kicked out of schools and things were happening. We didn't know how to pull things up. And I pulled the rock and said, God, would you be faithful? Is there some way? Like we, we, were, we were in over our heads. Can you make this work in some miraculous way? People show up and they think that we were just like really strategic and just executed this plan. This is not what happened. We have always been in over our heads in this. And it's because we, we try to say, God, what, we wanna follow what you're saying. And we know, we believe that God, he, he acts. We meet his faithfulness when we act in faith and often not before then. A lot of us think that if we could just figure out the plan, if we could just figure out the plan then we could execute it. We often read our Bibles like this. I'll find the five things that God wants. I'll go back and execute them. And then I'll be like he wants me to be. And that's not how this works. Spiritual formation, this is sort of the principle. This, this clarity that you long for 
isn't about how well you execute a plan. It's about your willingness to participate with him. The clarity doesn't come by knowing the path that you're supposed to take. It comes by taking a step. It comes when you're willing to step into something. My, my one word for the last couple of years um, have, have been uh, really important to me. They, they have been for, for a long time. But it's so interesting to look back because um, last year was detail. The year before, um, it was behold, produce, uh, things like this. There were, there were all these kind of things. And a lot of what it was, I look back now and I see how it was this longing for some vision. I just didn't want to, I, w- I didn't want to stop short of what God had wanted once for our church. I don't want to just be about getting bigger and more people. I want, I want to say, God, what do you have? In it? And for a long time, I, 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 to be honest, I just didn't know. And what happens is when you start to, to move into these places and the, the, the thing that I've become convinced of in my life is because I don't know how God is going to do something has no bearing on his capacity to pull it off. Because you can't calculate how it's gonna work from where you are doesn't mean that he can't do it or he won't do it. In fact, it has no bearing on whether he can do it or not. Your job, my job is to be faithful to him, to step where he leads And part of that is to be willing to walk into places that are uncertain and when you don't have clarity. And I'll tell you, you know, my my job, part of my responsibility here is is that of vision. I'm supposed to be like one of the the drivers of like what God is doing and what we're called to do. And for about two and a half years, I'm like, I don't really know, but I think we should take this step. And we we all work together to do this. And it, it took a long time to just sit in this uncertainty for over two years to try and allow it to unfold, to see what kind of person, what God was doing in me over the time. And I say that because for a lot of you, you're, 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 you're paralyzed because you can't figure out how something's gonna go. And what God may be asking you to do is to simply take a step. So <clears throat> the question is, what is that step? And maybe a better way to ask the question is what Carson ended with last week, asked a great question for us to end that I'm gonna just kind of pull it out and summarize a little bit, but this is gonna happen over the next 11 and a half months. And the question is, in January, 2024, what story are you gonna tell? What story are you gonna tell? And for me, what I've tried to do for most of my life, and I, I, this is the way I think you and I learn to do this, is number one is you have to identify God's work in your life. You have to stop and say, what is it that God is doing in me? I look back and I can see there were things that he was trying to break, this sense of competition, this this chronic competitiveness, this super drivenness to be broken, for those things to give way to other attributes, to other things that allow me to have a much more uh, available pastoral heart for what God wanted to do in and through my life. And I can look back and tell you where he's dealt with some insecurities in my life. Places where I was so insecure. Places where and other people have been able to see this and articulate. I mean, probably eight or nine years ago, one of our board members, our board chairman, um, we were talking about the strategic plans. And listen, man, I love an adventure like anybody. My attention span is like about 11 and a half seconds and I'm, I'm Dory, I can be anywhere at any moment in time. It doesn't take much at all. And he said to me, he said, Mike, you, know, you're, you keep coming up with all these new ideas every month what the church should be doing. And we're like going in this direction. Then we thought we're going in this direction. He said, you are very opportunistic, but you are not strategic at all. I'm like, I'm offended. <laughs> he says, you can't just chase every shiny object that comes. And so what I had to do, and these are, these are for formative things. It's not a strategy. It's Lord, how can I become, and the word was organizationally disciplined. I had to recognize that there were things that I needed to do to tend to my own imagination in my own head, but there were things I was responsible for in terms of my vocation, what God had called me to do. And that's true for you. It doesn't matter if you're a mom or a dad or a teacher or a lawyer or you work in a restaurant or whatever. You have a vocation. You have a responsibility there to bring something to bear, to offer something. And who you're becoming in those moments actually matters. I mean, honestly, the way you do the little things 
The way you work at Chick-fil-A is the way you're going to lead a church. If you don't tend to the little things, if you don't learn to do the thousand little things with intentionality and effort, when the big things come along, all it's going to do is expose the worst parts of who you are. We have to have ways for us, right, to stay focused, to pay attention to this, to, uh, to articulate. And that's the second principle is that you have to be able to articulate God's work in your life. And the, the only way I know to do that is to write it down, is to write it down. Um, I know I hammer journaling a lot. And I would say you could also do this um, some way digitally using photos or things. I think there's a lot of ways to do it. But, but my point is you have to pay attention to what's happening. And, and I, I've just found no better way than to give words to it. I've just found no better way than to spend time and to try to give words to it. We live in a culture that is like super prone to hype. And you just, oh man, just dude, so far for God. Good. What do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean about fired up for God? What do you mean? Well, you know, I'm just, just fired up for God. I'm like, no, I don't mean. I don't know what you mean. Can you explain it? And the answer is no, I can't. Because I've not taken this emotion and this sense of feeling and put words to it so I can see and understand what is happening in my life. This isn't about being smart. It's not about intellect. It's about learning how to pay attention. It's about learning and growing. Um, I write the way that I do because I, I will not slow down if I don't have mechanisms. One of the things that's interesting is in my journal every year, this is my actual journal this year, is I sit down and make a list of all the words that I've picked. This is now 17 words. These are stones in the river. I can look back and see a whole season of insecurity. Four of these words were picked because I didn't believe I had anything to offer. Now you're looking at it and going, that's so dumb, Mike. Yeah, it probably was, but that's how I felt. You got this thing, everything thinks you're good at it and you feel like you don't have anything to offer to anybody. And these words, to invest, fountain, were to pursue and say, Lord, you've obviously done some things in me. Can you help me come to believe that I have something to offer? And I look at my life today and that's not even really a thought on my radar. I'm like, God, thank you. It doesn't mean I don't still show with insecurity, but I'm, I'm saying that it's not the same as it was. And, and what I do now, and this is just free, this isn't gonna cost you anything. This is what I do to plan my day. I'm a terrible planner. In fact, this is actually notes that I wrote on the front of my journal and it's got confidential information on it. And so I drew a black marker and redacted it so nobody can read it. And every week on Sunday night or usually Monday morning, I get up and my week starts with this blank picture here. There's no days in it. There's no month in it. There's no word in it. Do you know why? Because if I miss a week, you know what happens when you buy a planner and it's got all the dates filled out and you miss a week, the whole thing's ruined. It's like, I'm sending it back and I'm sorry, we're next year. I'll just wait till 2024. So this way, if I miss one, there are times when there's like two or three weeks that are missing, but I just pick up on Monday and every Sunday night, it's a chance to start all over again. So I'm not promising myself forever and I fill it in. And what I do is I sit down and the first thing that I do is I put in all the days, right, the month in, so it's good to know what month it is. All the dates, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 through 11, I write my one word right there and then I start putting in any of the meetings or appointments that I have and I write them down by hand. I'm not trying to get you to be an artist. I'm trying to invite you to slow down. Recurring calendar events mean you don't have to think about them. And guess what happens when you don't think about them? You probably don't think about them. Everyone. I write down. This actually doesn't take that long. But I get to see this meeting through the lens of my word. I get to see this phone call. I have a list here that's my lift list. This is the people I'm praying for, the things that I'm praying for. This is my stuff because I hate to-do lists. So I just call it stuff. It makes me feel better about myself. And I can put dumb things on there. And I just look at this. It's not rocket science. So 
this is what I want you to do. Um, I want you to pick one word. This is your first exercise in saying no. Pick one word. I got more, but I'm going to stop. Everybody in here got a card, right? You got a card? You can get it out. And you can get out your phone. Then you start tweeting your friends and tell me you're going to be late for lunch. Tell them it's my fault. Open it up and you can like click right on there and it'll say open in Safari and you click it. And it takes you to the Safari page. And in there, you have your one word. It's got the whole process in there. And so I want you to pick one word. And if you have two, my new rule on my one word is if you have two or more words, your friend or your spouse gets to pick your word for you. So you might wanna pick your own. And then secondly, I want you to keep it in front of you. I want you to find a way to keep it in front of you. Put it on your lock screen on your phone. I use, I use my, my handy dandy planner and keep it in front of you. And what I'm gonna ask you, there's a place on there to share your word. And if you do that, we would love to invite you to, to share your word. If you haven't picked, I haven't picked my word yet. I'm picking mine on February the 1st, so I have a couple more days. Um, I'm very close, but I haven't picked it yet. But this takes you through some process. If you haven't, if you haven't done the personal retreat yet, what you might hear is, hey, consecrate yourselves today. You can do the personal retreat at the end of January. Consecrate yourselves today because what if tomorrow God did some things in you and that each day his presence and his work in your life became the primary shaping force in your life? What story would you tell in December, end of, end of this year, if that were true of you. So what I'm asking you to do is to commit to the process. Commit to the process. Take a step. Maybe it's picking your word. Maybe it's having a conversation. Maybe it's pursuing small group. Maybe it's, it could be a process with other people, whatever it needs to be. Take a step. Commit to the process. And when you submit your word to us, we're gonna commit to helping you in that process over the course of this entire year, which means we're not gonna let you forget your word. <laughs> Be a lot of fun. And so if that happened, right, if that really happened, and you became a little closer to the kind of person that God has created you to become, right, how thrilled would you be to tell of the work that God did, you, did in you in 2023? And it all begins with a step that you're willing to take today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for meeting us here. Um, we, we do ask, Father, that you would, you would speak to us and remind us of your faithfulness and then give us the courage to take steps believing that it, is, that, that it is true. And Father, that in that you form us and shape us into the kind of people that you have created us to be. Help us to see and remember, to know. Father, you would um, just guide us. And so I lift this to you in the name of your son, Jesus, who is our King. Amen.